Welcome to the Wiring WIC uh, Symposium. We're going to be talking about technology innovations to strengthen the special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children. And I want to thank my collaborators from the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, the Department of Nutrition, Dr. Walter Willett, and the MIT Media Lab, Dr. David Newman, who we'll be, we'll be hearing from later. Next slide. We have an incredible group of speakers today uh, and experts from uh, policymakers to foundation leaders, to people doing the research in the field. You'll be hearing from them all uh, during this program. Next. Over the uh, course of the symposium, we're gonna be talking about what is WIC. We're gonna talk about the recommendations of the uh, Wiring WIC Health and Technology Summit. We're gonna talk about some of the challenges and changes to WIC that were made with the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, what's happening with the infant formula shortage today. Um, and then we're gonna have a wonderful panel discussion of experts talking about progress that's been made uh, in implementing technology into WIC as well as future directions. Next. We're here today because hunger is a major public health crisis in America. In last year, 45 million people, including 15 million children, experienced food insecurity in our country, and the rates have gone up significantly uh, during the COVID pandemic. Research shows that poverty and adversity during a child's early years can have a lifelong impact on their physical, mental, and economic health and well being. Next. Food insecurity and obesity are now converging in our country um, and particularly impacts low income communities. 10.5% of households are food insecure and 31% of our nation's children are overweight or obese, 73% of adults. This could be the first generation of children that are not as healthy or live as long as their parents. Next. And that's where WIC comes in. For nearly five decades, WIC has served as a vital safety net program, providing nutritious foods to supplement diets, nutrition education, breastfeeding counseling, and healthcare referrals for low income, pregnant and postpartum women, infants and children up to age five who are deemed medically or nutritionally at risk. It's administered by the Food and, uh, and Nutrition Service at USDA and locally administered by 89 state agencies. Next. Uh, in 2020, 6.2 million people received WIC benefits. And as you can see, uh, WIC serves a diverse population groups. Next. Critically, and did you know that 50% of all infants born in the United States are enrolled in WIC today? Next. And this is why WIC is the largest buyer of infant formula in the United States, making up more than half of annual formula sales. Um, and so the, the shortage and the recall that has occurred is particularly impacting our nation's low income uh, families uh, enrolled in WIC. Next. We'll hear more about this later in our program. Uh, despite serving as a critical source of nutrition, only 57.4% of eligible people are enrolled in WIC, including just 53% of eligible pregnant women. And there's a significant attrition rate from the program. While almost 99% of, of, of infants are enrolled in the program, by the time the child ages out at five, only 25% are enrolled in the program. Why is this? Well, there are a number of participation barriers uh, for WIC, including transportation challenges, stigma, figuring out what foods are eligible. The participant's regular store doesn't participate in WIC or carry the right selection or sizes of WIC foods. There can be long waiting times for clinic appointments and before the pandemic in-person only appointments and language barriers as well. And many of these problems could be solved in part by modernization of WIC with technology. Next. Why does WIC matter? Because uh, children in WIC have better and learning out and it every dollar spent on WIC more than doubles its return. Um, WIC is not just about pro providing food and nourishment, it's about empowering mothers. And parents should view WIC as a valuable and relevant source of support during one of the busiest times of their lives, not as a program with barriers, stigma, and navigation difficulties. Next. 
So we asked, what if the delivery of WIC benefits and services could be modernized with technology and social media to help boost enrollment and decrease attrition? Next. And that's what the Wiring WIC, the Health and Technology Initiative is all about. In 2017, we held a summit to highlight opportunities for technology uh, to strengthen WIC. We built a website, wiringwic.org, as a hub for information about WIC. And today we're releasing a report and executive summary of our findings. Next. A culture of health in America requires that everyone has access to the resources they need to flourish in their communities. And this initiative supported the belief that technology can fundamentally help modernize WIC in, in combination with in-person services. The initiative's goal was to identify ways to integrate cutting edge technology so that, that the program could more effectively, equitably and efficiently deliver benefits and services now and in the years ahead. Next. So in 2017, we held a summit. Uh, it was held at the MIT Media Lab with multidisciplinary experts from tech, from public health and design, along with WIC agency directors and participants to engage in out of the box thinking and imagine what was possible for WIC in the digital age. We held this meeting in anticipation of the transition from the delivery of food benefits from paper vouchers, which had been from the beginning of the program to EBT cards for distribution. And at the summit, we workshopped and we proposed technology solutions that could enhance WIC services and increase the impact of the program in anticipation of the EBT transition that was going to occur three years later. And we fostered cross-sectoral collaboration, partnerships and networks uh, to leverage the power of technology and social media to strengthen the program. Next. Next. And here are our project recommendations. Next. First, uh, the bottom line is that technology should be integrated into WIC to create a human-centered, a culturally sensitive, efficient, equitable, and more accessible program for participants, that it should be a hybrid program that includes both technology-enhanced services and in-person services. And the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the implementation of our recommendations, some of which were going on before the conference, and many uh, now are are being uh, implemented. Next. We looked across a mother's journey through WIC to see where technology could make a difference. Next. Firstly, how do we inform eligible mothers about WIC? Well, the first recommendation was that we need to conduct WIC outreach through other federal assistance programs. About 80% of current WIC participants are enrolled in one or more federal assistance programs like TANF or Medicaid. And so we need to create more digital outreach um, and using texting to inform others and projects are underway that have found this to be extremely effective. Uh, but uh, people should be able to be seamlessly cross-enrolled um, if they're in Medicaid, for example, into WIC without having to upload all of their other documents um, and making it really easy for people to get into the program. Next. We also want to use social media to conduct WIC outreach and recruitment. And again, since the conference was convened, social media is being used more and more um, by USDA, by the National WIC Association and other organizations that should continuously develop resources and tools to help WICs local agency across America identify and enroll eligible people. Next. We need to update and the application and certification process with digital portals and interactive custom, customized mobile and web-based apps that simplified and facilitate the WIC application process and creating a digital wallet to streamline cross-enrollment. Next. And modernizing the clinic and education experience is also critical. So again, this hybrid in-person virtual WIC experience, again, apps and web-based technologies, including telehealth services, which were approved with the pandemic with waivers to create a more personalized nutrition education experience and provide breastfeeding, breastfeeding support virtually as well. Again, that remote service provision um, in WIC by permanently waiving the physical presence requirements in the program. And again, reducing clinic waiting times by offering appointment scheduling through web-based and text messaging. Next. We need to explore digital innovations to improve the shopping experience. Already many state local agencies are using uh, WIC shopping apps 
um, to create an easier and more innovative shopping experience. But we also need to allow online ordering and mobile pay, in-store curbside pickup and home delivery for with participants so that they can shop like other retail experiences, like other people in America and expanding partnerships with online vendors for ease of food benefit redemption. Next. We need to reduce WIC attrition rates with engaging user-friendly apps, texting, teleconferencing, and other uh, digital services. So creating WIC online ordering platforms, forming social network groups as virtual co-ops for mothers to share, WIC participation experiences, breastfeeding support, parenting tips, and childcare information. Next. And then we have some priority policy recommendations that we, we wanna discuss with all of you today. Um, first, we need to leverage partnerships to enhance the participants' experience and improve program administration. We need to foster partnerships between the government, experts in tech, policy, design, public health, EBT vendors, app developers, and researchers. And we need to work um, you know, to pr promote uh, mobile-based transactions at farmers' markets to enable greater access to fresh produce. And then also working with venues such as museums and public transportation to recognize with EBT as passes for low cost um, access to various venues. Next. We also believe that a national WIC Technology Assistance Center for research and program improvements uh, should be created um, to design a, a cross agency data warehouse for routine uploads of de-identified administrative health outcomes and EWIC data um, and develop technical guidelines and protocols so that there can be compatibility across WIC management systems. Next. Conduct re regular uh, evaluations of technology tools on WIC's impact, provide technical assistance to all WIC agencies, and conduct research to demonstrate how local agencies can use existing WIC data to boost retention and decrease attention, and uh, increase research on the use of cutting edge technologies. This is very important to see how these technologies are impacting enrollment and retention in the program. Next. We need to involve participants and staff in WIC program modernization. We need to wire WIC's program culture and ensure equity in the program. So clearly the end user needs to be a part of this process uh, to design technology innovation, innovations and conducting research, ensuring inclusivity and improving service delivery and education. We also need to provide staff training to build proficiency with these new digital tools to help create a cultural shift that supports the use of technology innovations in combination with in-person services. Developing online and mobile app surveys for WIC participants to identify and implement technology enhancements and ensure equity and access to digital tools and services that are modernizing WIC. Next slide. The COVID pandemic has revealed the shameful health disparities that have existed for all too long in our society, having a disproportionate toll on Black, Hispanic, Indigenous Americans, and low-income communities. As we emerge from this health and economic crisis, equity must be central to every solution proposed in our society, including in WIC, whose mission is to provide a just and healthy start for the most vulnerable in America. Next. And while technology can be a force for connecting people, information and services, it can also perpetuate inequities. So digital uh, skills and access has now become a key social determinant of health as um, these resources are increasingly moving online. So um, we know that uh, access to devices and broadband is problematic in some communities, including for minority populations and rural areas of our country, uh, creating a digital divide. So, uh, we need to really ensure that low cost broadband access is expanded and that WIC really needs to be addressing the, equi the equity impact of the program to ensure that tech and other interventions are culturally sensitive and responsive. Next. We need to focus on participant-centered technology at the USDA uh, with special task force. One has, has already been uh, created on online ordering and uh, permanently allow WIC local agencies to use approved telehealth technology and other digital services. Next. 
need to focus on uh, conducting annual surveys and mapping of the spectrum of technology tools being used, developing tutorials and guidance and templates to assist local WIC agencies and clinics, and design a section of USDA's website to serve as a technology resource hub with guidance on how to use apps and social media for outreach to WIC participants. Next. We need to dedicate funding on modernizing WIC technology infrastructure and, and innovations. Um, that means increasing congressional appropriations so that all 89 agencies can use and benefit from these advances and designing a universal open source digital ecosystem with USDA developed standards, guidelines, and protocols so that agencies and vendors can facilitate system integration across technology uh, providers. And again, increasing support for digital pilot programs such as online ordering, delivery services, and mobile pay. Next. And lastly, you know, designing a national online education resource uh, hub and toolkit um, for education for parents and families across America about nutrition to ensure a healthy start in life for their children. Next. Um, many of the, the changes in these recommendations that we've talked about have been accelerated by uh, the COVID pandemic. Some were underway already uh, before uh, the conference uh, went in place, but uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, through the Food and uh, Nutrition Service of USDA approved over 800 WIC waivers and it importantly waived the physical presence requirement that had been required for enrollment certification, nutrition education, and issuing of food benefits. Next. Additionally, the American Rescue Plan of 2021 has included $390 million of funding to support WIC outreach, innovation, and program modernization efforts. We're hopefully, um, you know, giving flexibility uh, to many of the, uh, the, the, the barriers that have been in the program, put, keeping the waivers in place um, will help to modernize this program moving forward. And importantly, in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act of 2021, $65 billion was included for expanding broadband access. 14.8 uh, million people don't have it, particularly in our minority communities. And this could help reduce disparities in access to digital services and resources in WIC and other federal and state uh, assistance programs. Next. From the EBT transition in 2020 and the COVID pandemic has come opportunities to modernize WIC. Most of today's new parents are millennial or Gen Z who are highly connected to tech and keen on using social media. These parents need to view WIC as a valuable and easy access to a source of food and nutrition services to help them raise healthy children. Um, while WIC has significantly increased the use of technology since the program was established, including the EBT implementation and waivers as a result of the pandemic, the program's continued success will depend on its ability to serve new generations of beneficiaries through digital innovations, platforms, and services that allow high quality WIC services to be delivered remotely as well as in person. Next. So we believe that creating a technology enhanced WIC can provide more ways to reach participants and meet their diverse needs, helping to boost participation and retention in the program. We believe that WIC rules should be prospective and look to be inclusive of next gen technologies and new regulations and system changes must include uh, these anticipations of innovations that will be occurring in the future. Next. The need to alleviate food insecurity, reduce obesity, and enhance the health of Americans is so pressing that every effort must be made to strengthen, modernize, and wire WIC as a critical safety net program for millions of Americans, including nearly 50% of all infants in the United States, an essential part of our nation's future. Next. Thank you uh, so much for, for listening. And uh, if you want more information and a copy of our report, please uh, check out www.wiringwick.org. And uh, you can also press a button on the screen uh, to get a copy of the report. Well, it's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you Dr. Walter Willett, uh, Professor of Epidemiology and Nutrition at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, who served as an collaborator and leader on the Wiring Wick Health and Technology Initiative. When you Google the word nutrition, up pops Dr. Willett's picture as the most cited nutritionist globally. 
Dr. Willett has focused much of his career over the past 40 years on the development and evaluation of methods to study the effects of diet um, on, the, uh, uh, on the risk and protective factors for chronic diseases. He's published more than 2,000 scientific articles, authored several books, and received numerous awards for his landmark contributions to advancing nutrition and health in America and around the world. Dr. Willett. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Blumenthal. And it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And it's also been a great pleasure for me and my fellow department members at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health uh, and Nutrition to be part of this program, starting it with our symposium in 2017 and right up to issuing this uh, important report. Uh, most of my work as an adult has been related to my training as a physician in internal medicine, and more recently as a nutritional epidemiologist. So mostly I've been looking at adult issues in health and nutrition, uh, and what we see is a very concerning problem. But again, it connects directly with what is going on during pregnancy, infancy, and early childhood. Probably the most obvious and conspicuous issue has been the obesity epidemic. And we hardly need statistics to appreciate that. We've often seen this picture showing from about uh, year 2000, where obesity affected approximately 30% of adult Americans, and by 2018, up to 42%. But actually, if we go back in time further to when I started working on this project, only about 10% of American adults were obese. So there's been about a fourfold increase over this period of time, and it's still going up unrelentingly. And in children, there's also been a fourfold or greater increase in obesity over this time period. Next slide, please. Uh, and if we take the trajectories uh, of actual weight gain in children, uh, one of my colleagues here at uh, Harvard has also done an analysis uh, looking at the uh, predicted prevalence of obesity among the children who are today two years of age and the projected uh, prevalence of obesity by the time they're 35 is actually over 50%. And we know that at 35, people are still gaining weight uh, uh, steadily. So by the time they reach 50 or 60, the prevalence is going to be way over 50% for just obesity, not even counting overweight. Next slide, please. And as sure as night follows day, uh, diabetes follows obesity. And here we see even by the time someone gets, or a group of people get up to be uh, overweight, even before they're uh, obese, the rate of obesity is about 10 to 20 fold increase higher than it would be for people who are uh, lean. And uh, then again, it, the risk goes up steadily being about 60 fold higher for people with moderate levels of obesity compared to people uh, without overweight or obesity. Next uh, slide, please. And as sure, sure as uh, day follows night, after diabetes comes increasing risk of heart disease. And this has been going down for decades. We had about an 80% decline in heart disease mortality up to the, about uh, 2010, and then it started plateauing. And in fact, uh, uh, there's been some increase in coronary heart disease mortality since about uh, 2014. Next slide, please. And it's not just heart disease, obesity-related cancers, which had been coming down, like colorectal cancer, are now going back up in more recent generations. Next slide. And of course, this all plays out into life expectancy. And even before the pandemic, uh, life expectancy had been going down in the, about four years prior to the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, some of this is related to opioids, but the, a long-term driver is excess uh, rates of obesity and, uh, and, and overweight. Uh, and of course, as Dr. Uh, Blumenthal mentioned, uh, the averages don't tell the full story because this has impacted different parts of our population very differently. Uh, white Americans lost about one year of life expectancy. Latino population lost about five years of life expectancy. And Black Americans lost about uh, three years of life expectancy. So huge reversals uh, due to, of course, many factors, not just nutrition, but um, work sites and excessive exposure due to high-risk occupations. Next slide, please. 
but there is a very clear risk, a very clear association between overweight and obesity and actual severe COVID. Uh, that the issue isn't whether someone gets infected or not, but the uh, severity of COVID, uh, that obesity and diabetes uh, together contribute somewhere around uh, 30 to 50% of uh, hospitalizations for, uh, for uh, due to COVID. And overall, uh, risk factors related to nutrition uh, potentially contribute about 60%. Uh, to, of the uh, excess high-risk uh, cases of COVID. So uh, the, having a good diet won't protect you from getting, from getting infections, but it can protect you to some degree from getting severe and fatal infections. Next slide, please. Of course, immunizations are number one. Uh, to put this uh, somewhat bluntly, we've entered a, dive, a death spiral in this country. Uh, as weight gain goes up, we have more cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, arthritis. All of those cause reductions in physical activity. Uh, that leads to more television watching, and we see that's directly related to more consumption of junk food. And all through the cycle, there's aggressive marketing of unhealthy food to children who can't really make the distinction between healthy food and unhealthy food. And that all leads to more weight gain. And then we're spinning around here uh, to uh, premature death. And unless we break this cycle uh, strongly in multiple places, uh, it's pretty clear we are going to see mortality uh, to, uh, to go up and life expectancy to go down. Next slide, please. Uh, this is not totally surprising that we're seeing this. Uh, we uh, several years ago did an analysis using NHANES data looking at the foods that people were, uh, people at less than 130% of the federal poverty line were consuming. And it paints a stark picture. Whole grains, uh, this is servings per day, less than half a serving a day. Refined grains, 4.6 servings a day, less than one serving a day of fruit, vegetables, and potatoes almost equal to non-starchy vegetables. Uh, and uh, certainly generous amounts of red meat, processed meats, and almost three servings a day per, uh, of sugar-sweetened beverages. So from all of our research, we see that this diet is actually the fuel for overweight uh, obesity and diabetes. So it's no, sh no big surprise that what we see happening in terms of disease and life expectancy is, is actually happening. Next slide, please. The uh, good news here is that uh, standards and policy can make really important differences. This was strikingly apparent for the uh, effects of implementing new standards for foods in schools. On a scale of zero to 100 in 2010, the quality of food served in schools was about 58%. And after the implementation of new standards, and there was some unhappiness and pushback about raising the standards, but this really made a difference. Uh, it, this went up to 81 out of 100, uh, just in that very short period of time. And so what we're talking today about WIC is really important. WIC is a wonderful program, really important, uh, but it's uh, tr equally important that uh, all kids who are eligible uh, be enrolled and that we have high retention of those that are enrolled. We know that this can really make an important difference to long-term health and well-being and help close the tremendous gaps uh, across subgroups of our population. So again, thank you. And I hope this effort will be uh, beneficial to uh, be helpful to those running the WIC program to Department of Agriculture and especially helpful to participants. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Willett, uh, for your, uh, you know, really setting the stage of the importance of nutrition uh, to health and for your leadership. Well, it's been terrific to collaborate on this project uh, with the Harvard School of Public Health and also with the MIT Media Lab, which is an oasis of multidisciplinary work and a hub of innovation where our summit was convened. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you a gifted scientist who is the embodiment of innovation and new frontiers of exploration, the director of the MIT Media Lab, Dr. Deva Newman. She also serves as the Apollo Program Professor of Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she's a Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology faculty member. Prior to these positions, Dr. Newman served as NASA 
deputy administrator from 2015 to 2017. She was the first female engineer in this role, and she was awarded the NASA Distinguished Service Medal for our, her outstanding leadership and contributions. Welcome, Dr. Newman. Hello, thank you, Dr. Blumenfeld. So wonderful to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, so this isn't rocket science. This, this isn't rocket science, right? Uh, maybe it's harder. We just really are here today to celebrate uh, the start, right? To celebrate an amazing report, the recommendations. We were so glad to convene everyone here uh, together with our colleagues at uh, Harvard uh, School of Public Health, of course, with New America and um, the recommendations in this report are so important, so important to mothers and infants and children, and that means all of us. It should be human right to have great medical care, to have great food, to have wonderful food, to have a chance, to have a chance um, for all those little folks to, to dream and um, attain, you know, be, get to the moon and, and, and Mars, which is what my dream for them is, but it starts with nutrition. It starts with being healthy and where we come in, again, being the technologist or, or innovators are so happy to just be part of this discussion is when you highlighted all those recommendations, we really want to accelerate positive change. And let me give you some examples of the digitization. It's so important. We already have the technologies today. We have the technologies today. We've made those innovations so that literally everyone should be able to, every mother, hold that in the palm of your hand to have that digital, digital record, that digital application that you're talking about, making it very easy. So not too cumbersome, not too bureaucratic to make sure that everyone has access. You show the numbers, not everyone has access to even having the internet, let alone high bandwidth on the internet. We need, to, we need to change that. We need to give everyone equal access, as you mentioned. It's all about equity. It's about really empowering folks. It's about saving, saving lives at the end of the day. It's about empowering everyone. Everyone definitely needs to have equal access to the technologies, to the information, to you know, beautiful, healthy food that is going to um, overcome. <laughs> I remain the eternal optimist, overcome so many of the challenges that Dr. Willett put before us in terms of obesity and, and the diabetes. I hadn't seen that um, spiral that was uh, pretty powerful to take a look at that circular downward spiral. Spiral. When we think about technologies, think about um, the ease of, of telehealth, telemedicine, how can we empower people? How can we get people right out of that spiral just again to go about their daily great work healthy but so this doesn't take people down that so it empowers them with the tools the digital tools um, the modernization the innovations that necessarily uh, we all need to work on together they are for everyone it was mentioned equity everyone should have equal access equal opportunity to all of the technologies tools all the digitization and I would add maybe personalization of, of health, of health for the mothers, of health for the infants and children, so that we can get everyone to a very healthy, equitable state. Then all those little kids with their brain power turned on, they're going to help us all. They're going to help us all solving the challenges we have. And um, just kind of go full circle to also saying the research elements that, that you mentioned. That's exactly what we do at the MIT Media Lab. We're a lot of data scientists, we use a lot of artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning. That's because we're kind of curating the data because we can look at that data, we can visualize that data and we can hopefully almost in real time understand the data and then maybe help people make positive changes. Maybe help people take the, the appropriate action so that they can uh, live well, be healthy. Of course, that's what everyone wants but hopefully some of the digitization, the tools. And uh, my dream is that everyone could just uh, have the information right here, uh, you know, in the palm of their hand. That would be uh, the most convenient, easy, you know, most accessible um, way that this, I see going forward very optimistically and trying to make the most impact for society and most equity that's possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Newman. You are the Apollo Professor of Astronautics. And today, as you point out, we have the power of the uh, computer that was on the Apollo mission in our pockets. Let's make sure that it works for everyone. And it was so exciting working with the MIT Media Lab and really bringing the tech innovation 
this public health of hunger. So thank you for your collaboration. Um, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce a very important and influential national leader on nutrition and uh, other issues related to health, Senator Roy Blunt. He serves as the chairman of the Senate Republican Policy Committee and as the ranking member of the Senate Rules Committee. He is also the ranking member of the U.S. Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education. Senator Blunt has been a leader for improving the health and nutrition of children in the United States. And last year, he introduced the Hunger Free Summer for Kids Act that would add flexibility to USDA's summer food service program, providing children free lunch and snacks during the summer months. So thank you so much for joining us today, Senator Blunt, and adding your powerful voice to this discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Blumenthal. It's great to be with you. Matter of fact, I was able to get in to, to the, listen to the discussion a little bit earlier. So I heard what you were saying and Dr. Willis and Dr. Newman, and uh, certainly helpful to be thinking about that. Obviously, Dr. Willis's comments about long-term uh, health challenges, uh, starting with habits that start early, makes the WIC program and nutrition programs uh, even more important than they would otherwise be. You know, when you begin to develop uh, the right kind of uh, habits early, it makes uh, a big difference. Uh, and uh, WIC in its best does that. Uh, and uh, the other thing I want to talk about before we're done would be the whole concept, Dr. Newman's concept of data. Uh, you know, we heard more about data, the la at least I did, the last two years and the shortcomings of data often and what we could have if we had better data. And uh, as Dr. Newman mentioned, if we have almost in real time data, you're not just talking about historic impact of data or what happened in some later period of time, but you also have some immediate predictability that might allow adjustments in uh, either programs or how you encourage things uh, within those programs. You know, we've all heard a lot, certainly every member of the House and Senate uh, has heard a lot in the last two weeks about the, the baby formula shortage, which is a huge uh, part of the WIC program. I think 50% uh, of newborns and young children uh, are in the WIC program. And uh, prior to COVID, uh, every state had the capacity to negotiate a specific company that they they became the provider for baby uh, formula in that state. Uh, we suspended that during COVID. It was suspended during the shortage, so that's not one of the problems for the shortage. Uh, but um, just a few days ago, the Congress uh, last late last week suspended that uh, permanently. That uh, you know, baby formula of your choice, as long as there wasn't some. WIC non-compliance issue uh, would be the baby formula that you could have. Uh, you know, I would like to say on the current shortage, uh, like so many things in a complicated society, this is something looking backwards, it, lo it looks like it would have been pretty easy to predict and maybe even prevent. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, people wondering about uh, why in October, uh, of last year when FDA was beginning to look at the potential problem uh, and between October and February when uh, uh, one of the Abbott labs, a principal provider of uh, baby formula was closed that there wouldn't be an anticipation that if something else didn't happen differently, there would be a, a big shortage by May, uh, which is what happened and probably some of the things we've done uh, right now, if we'd have done them a little earlier, suspending some tariffs, being sure that at least from the nine FDA approved uh, facilities in Europe, that we would be able to have formula coming back into this, co this country from those facilities, just like we're doing now. Uh, fly formula, I think is what uh, they're calling, calling that response. But, you know, looking a little further down the line, that's where data again becomes important and certainly the 10 year effort now to get states on a, a electronic uh, benefit card uh, that lets you see what's happening in real time and wonder what kind of adjustments uh, need to be made. 
Uh, the other thing I'd mention about WIC versus uh, the SNAP program, the food benefit, the other food benefit program, is that WIC is much more responsive to immediate cost increases. And obviously, we're going to see that right now. And you know, your, your WIC card, unlike your SNAP card that just has a benefit amount on it, your WIC card is very much impacted, or at least the pain for what you get on WIC is very much impacted by uh, significant pot by price increases. And right now at the grocery store, there there's significant price increases. We're going to see the cost of WIC go up. I believe that'll almost all be absorbed, if I understand the program the right way, by by the government as opposed to people using the WIC card. But uh, there are times when the, the government has to be really thinking about, okay, what's going on in this program? Is it properly funded for the circumstances we're in now. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, when I came to the Senate, uh, I was the top Republican on the Ag FDA committee. Herb Cole was the chairman uh, and there was a milk shortage. Uh, and, and we actually had to have a supplemental appropriations passed uh, to provide more money to the uh, uh, to WIC because of that milk shortage. And it was big enough that uh, the WIC funding wasn't going to cover the current cost of of uh, milk and uh, maybe other dairy products, and we had to we had to do that. But uh, looking at uh, you know what you all are talking about today, I think really uh, it's important to understand that uh, most parents today are very uh, very technically capable, uh, and having that card available to them or the availability of even be able to order uh, the products that WIC pays for directly uh, should make a, a big difference. And uh, look forward to reading this report, uh, to looking at what we can do with uh, more nutritional uh, possibilities uh, for, uh, for WIC. Um, I do remember another appropriating story uh, Susan Collins from Maine on the Appropriations Committee uh, in uh, fresh fruits and fruits and vegetables, potatoes were left off. And so Susan Collins being the loyal uh, Maine uh, Senator she is, had a, uh, had a major, in, in, in really caused us to have a major discussion about the value of the potato. And I think she did that with a bag of potatoes sitting right there uh, at the, uh, at the hearing table with her and potatoes weren't involved at the time were not part of what counted for fresh food, fruits and vegetables but have been since and so there actually is merit to reaching out to your representatives and senators if you think there are things in the WIC program uh, that you can make an argument why they either should be there or shouldn't be there uh, and um, I'm looking forward as I said to seeing your report seeing how far along we are with the transition and maybe more, just as importantly, seeing what other information we're gaining about the tr transition uh, that tells us about uh, what's happening with nutrition, what's happening uh, with um, infants and children. Thank you so much. Uh Senator Blunt for adding your important perspectives to our discussion and, and for underscoring the importance of data and technology, how they can be integrated into ensuring that this program maximizes its potential for a healthy start in life for children. Um, I'm now uh, delighted to introduce a leader whom I greatly admire, Senator Debbie Stabenow, the first woman from Michigan elected to the United States Senate. Senator Stabenow, uh, serves as chairwoman of the powerful Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee that authorizes WIC and other federal food assistance programs. She's also a senior member of the Senate Finance Committee, Budget Committee, and the Environment and Public Works Committee. Senator Stabenow has been a national leader and champion in promoting the importance of WIC and other federal nutrition assistance programs to reduce food insecurity and obesity in the United States and promote a healthier future for all Americans. Senator Stabenow. Hi, and thank you to Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, the MIT Media Lab, and New America 
for the chance to join you today for this important discussion. I have to tell you that I just left the floor of the United States Senate, and I know you're not getting this message for another week, but we just passed a really important bill to make sure WIC moms and, and babies particularly are able to get the formula they need in the middle of this crisis. Uh, there's so much to do. I appreciate Secretary Vilsack moving as quickly as possible to create some flexibilities in terms of purchasing brands and sizes and other things that are necessary. This bill also makes clear that if you have a WIC contract as a company, then you're going to have to put in place the plans for what you do if there is a recall, a shutdown, something happens in the future. So uh, we're better protecting uh, moms and babies. But I have to say that I think this has moved faster than I've ever seen uh, as we put this together. You know, we wrote it in two days when it became clear what was happening and jointly put it in the House and Senate, bipartisan, passed it uh, on Wednesday in uh, the House, and then the next day, now Thursday, we pass it in the Senate and it'll go to the President. This certainly isn't everything that needs to be done, but it's really important that we do everything we can to protect our moms and babies on WIC, and that's certainly my job as Chair of the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. And so I'm really glad that we've been able to put in place something that's going to ensure that our parents can feed their babies and equip USDA to better manage future formula disruptions. When we want to, we can move, and I would love to see more of that happening in the United States Senate. You know, continued innovation like this is essential to make sure WIC can easily and effectively provide healthy, nutritious food to the people it serves. Powered by the groundbreaking teams at Harvard and MIT and supported by New America, your discussions today will bring valuable new ideas to the table to help us get there. As the pandemic and the recent baby formula shortage have shown us, we have to constantly reinvent how people can access the help they need through critical programs like WIC. In my work on the Agriculture Committee, I've fought for funding and resources for this kind of modernization, as well as more funding for WIC food packages so moms can get more healthy fruits and vegetables for their kids. The $390 million in modernization funding in the American Rescue Plan will help WIC providers better serve participants through telehealth, WIC online, and eWIC. Through the Consolidated Appropriations Act, I've helped establish a task force to study how we can move WIC benefits online. And the pandemic has demonstrated the value of additional outreach and streamlined En enrollment. And we're not done. As we consider reauthorization of our child nutrition programs like WIC, we're looking to do even more to modernize how folks can get the help they need. You are the brightest minds and biggest innovators in this space. Your ideas will help us use the tools and technologies of today to serve people in need tomorrow and into the future. I'm so proud to be your partner in this work. I now want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Rajiv Shaw, who serves as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, an extraordinary charitable organization that has as its mission promoting the well being of humanity around the world. The Rockefeller Foundation provided support for this Wiring WIC initiative, and we're very appreciative to them. Uh, for that uh, leadership. Dr. Shaw has had a number of important positions, including serving as the administrator of USAID. And before that, he was the undersecretary for research, education, and economics, as well as the chief scientist at the US Department of Agriculture. So he's been particularly impactful on critical issues of nutrition and health. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, albeit virtually. I wanna thank Dr. Susan Blumenthal for inviting me to be part of this important event and for her important leadership. 
Last month, The Atlantic published an article on efforts to relieve what is called the time tax, the administrative burdens families face when applying for public assistance. The piece opens by describing what a mother in Louisiana must have to complete a 26-page application for benefits from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. That mother must provide paperwork or data in up to 13 categories, including baptism certificates. She must detail income from 24 possible sources, and she must document 14 different household-related expenses. These are just a few of the required inputs. If that Louisiana mother doesn't complete every one of them and complete them correctly, her application may be rejected and her children may not have enough food to eat that month. When you hear stories like that one, it's easy to understand why billions of dollars of federal assistance are left on the table every year, while too many families experience hunger or difficulty with their financial position. And that's why we must all work together to automate and digitize these processes and bring them into the 21st century especially because COVID-19 exposed both how important access to the social safety net is and how tenuous that access can be. Federally funded aid was so effective that it actually lowered the poverty rate in 2020. But millions of people got help too late or not at all, as government offices closed and websites failed under the weight of unprecedented demand. The Rockefeller Foundation has been proud to work with New America and other partners across the country to address these challenges. Before and during the pandemic, we've been supporting initiatives like this one, working to expand access to the social safety net using data, technology, and design. The goal is to replace rigid, impersonal, and confusing processes. Instead, we want to see active processes that reach out to offer assistance when it is needed, provide multiple ways for people to get help, and respond to individual needs. Our grantees are already making progress in each of these areas. In 2020, they helped more than 100,000 people across at least 36 states secure more than $200 million in benefits. Efforts like these are so important. And so are events like this one, because we know that by working together, we can harness the power of science, data, and technology to help people become healthier and more economically stable. We can expand and strengthen America's social safety net, and we can finally make opportunity universal and sustainable for all. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you to do just that. Thank you for your important efforts. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. And again, thank you for your support of this initiative and, and for the work that the foundation is doing to really use technology and data to improve health in our country and around the world. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Stacy Dean. She is USDA's Deputy Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition and Consumer Services. And we're, we're so delighted that she could join us today. Stacey Dean works tirelessly to advance President Biden's agenda on increasing nutrition assistance for struggling families and individuals, as well as tackling systemic racism and barriers to opportunity that have de denied so many people the chance to get ahead. Prior to joining USDA, Stacey served as the Vice President for Food Assistance Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where she made important contributions to strengthening federal food assistance programs including WIC. This afternoon, Stacey will share with us new developments in the use of technology in WIC, as well as what is being done to address the infant formula shortage in the United States. And after her remarks, we're gonna open the floor to your questions. I really wanna acknowledge the incredibly deep challenge the WIC program and um, the whole country is facing right now with the infant formula recall and the associated supply shortfalls. So if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes updating folks on that. Um, uh, it goes without saying that this is an incredibly stressful time 
uh, one that no parent uh, should have to experience. And President Biden knows that families across the country are worried about finding enough infant formula to feed their babies. And that's why he has directed the administration to do everything possible in a whole of government approach to ensure that there is enough safe formula in the country for families that need it. Um, USDA has been working over time to answer that call in partnership with uh, other federal agencies and our state, local, private, and nonprofit partners. The good news is that infant formula manufacturers produced more formula in April and then in the month preceding the recall. And I know it may not seem like that uh, given the pictures of what you see on the shelves. So we have some work to do on distribution, but uh, the, the production side is uh, definitely answering the call. And at USDA, we're extending broad flexibilities to quickly increase access for families. Uh, we're working hand in hand with states and local WIC agencies along the way, putting the health and safety of all Americans first and foremost. This makes it uh, easier for WIC families to buy whatever product is available on the shelves. Uh, and many of you may have heard about that or seen some of uh, yesterday. Uh, Secretary Vilsack was in the news when he met a DOD flight in Indianapolis carrying more than uh, 70,000 pounds worth of specialty formula. Yesterday's shipment, a collaboration across DOD, HHS, and USDA, will help provide relief from specialty infant formula supply shortages. And this will not be the last of this operation or our efforts to resolve the shortage. We're focusing our immediate attention on formulas that are currently the hardest to get, um, specialty formulas like this expedited shipment of the amino acid-based uh, alpha amino formula, which are designed for infants with medical conditions to meet their special dietary needs. The administration is using every available tool to expedite, expedite uh, the increase of supply. Uh, and in the long run, and I heard uh, Senator Blunt talk about this and Senator Stabenow, we also must continue to take steps to shore up the resiliency of our food supply and ensure this never happens again. Uh, in WIC specifically, since the recall was announced in February, USDA has issued more than 200 regulatory waivers to give states maximum flexibility in their programs to respond to the recall. And we did uh, more than 100 of these within the first three days of the recall announcement. Thanks to the bipartisan action in Congress last week, which we heard Senator Stabenow talk about her vote on that bill, uh, these waiver authorities are now permanent and we've gotten somewhat expanded authority, um, which will strengthen our ability to address disruptions um, in the case of future recalls or emergencies, which of course we hope to never see uh, again, and we'll need to take action on those fronts as well. And we're gonna to continue to work with the private sector, including manufacturers, retailers, and health providers, as well as our government partners to pull every lever to address this shortage and get infants and families the care and nutrition that they need and deserve. So while we're addressing, uh, well, sorry, while addressing formula shortages is our top priority, you know, it is, it is without a doubt um, singularly what we are focused on at FNS right now. This gathering here today is focused on improving work for the longer term. And so the recall has underscored the vital role that WIC serves as a nutritional lifeline to millions of moms, caregivers, and children. And of course, this builds upon the similar critical lessons learned throughout COVID that also some of your speakers have talked about. It's really one of the many reasons we're looking to strengthen WIC as a part of a wider effort to promote nutrition security, uh, which we, uh, uh, we consider to be the consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, and affordable food. But WIC yields more dividends than just good nutrition. The program provides a healthy foundation to help kids unlock their full potential. And you know, the evidence really speaks for itself. Um, WIC participation correlates with fewer infant deaths and premature births, increased birth weights, and even better academic results. Um, the program has an amazing uh, peer, uh, peer breastfeeding counselor program. And if it's, uh, if it's not the largest in the country, it's certainly among the largest uh, breastfeeding programs uh, offered in the country. And it's increased breastfeeding rates amongst participants. And on top of that, WIC serves as one of the most powerful public health interventions to reduce stark racial disparities in maternal and child health, child health outcomes. But I, and we heard this again from other speakers, so I'm sorry to be repeating, but it, it, it bears repeating. I would wager that WIC is probably the best, most positive, powerful program we have that just simply not enough people know about. 
particularly eligible families and their healthcare providers. And the, higher, the healthcare providers may know about, but may not really know about in enough rich detail. So we have a lot of work to do to share that news. And we absolutely wanna make sure um, that you all can help us connect to eligible families. But before we seek to connect with eligible families, we've gotta make sure they're experienced when they reach out to learn about WIC, when they reach out to enroll in WIC, and when they uh, uh, seek to use their benefits in WIC, that that's a positive experience because that will of course be critical, critical um, validation that uh, uh, reaching out for help for this program is well worth the effort. Um, so at USDA, we're working to expand the impact of uh, WIC on three fronts, increasing enrollment, keeping participants enrolled for as long as they are eligible and ensuring equitable access so that all eligible families reap its benefits. And across all of these goals, technology plays a cru crucial role and we, we see that from wiring WIC. Um, WIC must serve participants in ways that work for families, and that means we've got some serious adaptation to do. Recognizing families' needs in today's world, the administration has extended significant new funding for outreach, innovation, and modernization as WIC. Uh, in WIC, the majority of these funds will leverage technology to enable states to update their business practices and boost service delivery. And as a part of this investment, uh, FNS and the US Digital Service are conducting research to pinpoint challenges that can be resolved through technical innovation. So let's go through an increasing enrollment. First, as I said, we want more eligible families to enroll in WIC. So to do so, we need to improve people's interaction with government services. For example, reducing the time it takes to enroll in or access services. Uh, to streamline these processes, we can provide simple, more convenient online forms available on a mobile phone. Or even better, we can use the federal data uh, and programs we already have to eliminate the form altogether. And so um, a prior speaker spoke to the long SNAP form in Louisiana. That should certainly mean that no one in WIC should have to fill out an eligibility form if they've gone through that trouble already. Um, and we also can do much more to ensure that we're data matching across WIC and Medicaid to identify people eligible for the program. In terms of retention, uh, once we've got families enrolled, we wanna keep them as participants for as long as they're eligible. And the research shows that WIC has the biggest impact on health outcomes if a child participates for the full five years. So that's really important to us. Unfortunately, retention remains challenging. Participation is relatively high amongst infants, but falls off considerably as children get older. So there's some friction there that we have to address. One pain point we hear is how transportation barriers and work hours make it difficult for participants to get into a WIC clinic in person. And as part of the pandemic response, WIC offices have experimented with using technology and virtual services to lessen these burdens. So we can move and we can move swiftly as Senator Stavano said. And uh, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Mary Center operates several WIC clinics in DC. They have an app for WIC participants that provides breastfeeding support and helps them learn about their WIC benefits and how to use them. So clients don't have to go into the office for those services. Additionally, many state WIC staff find that texting participants often generates better responses than phone calls. Um, so we're going to be providing grant opportunities for states to invest in more communications tools. I don't know if they're advanced, but they are new, a, a diverse set of communication tools, uh, including platforms that allow WIC staff to text with participants right from their desks. Another pain point we hear from WIC participants surrounds the stigma of shopping in the store with the benefits. And over the last few years, technology has helped to address this issue as most states have transitioned from paper-based uh, coupons or vouchers to uh, debit cards or EBT cards. But we're also seeing a lot of um, positive reactions to WIC shopping apps that let participants scan barcodes to confirm whether a food is WIC eligible, right? To eliminate a friction and embarrassment or a stigma at the um, at the uh, checkout line. And this individual can, th this can actually really particularly help individuals with limited English proficiency, where they might be concerned about asking. We're also actively engaged in promoting pilots that allow vendors to offer online shopping, uh, a, an innovation we know we need to make soon, uh, very soon, uh, which will help promote equity by affording families in WIC the same conveniences as other American consumers. So, um, 
Uh, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Blumenthal, but I am a former advocate. Uh, and so I have a rule as an advocate that you never leave the room without making an ask. So I want to check in with all of you on we have an ambitious plan at, uh, within the administration for WIC, but I want to make sure I leave you all with ideas for how you can help. Um, as we constantly strive for improvement in WIC, um, we, we want to absolutely deliberately uh, emphasize equity and collaboration. Uh, and these, our efforts here are really no exception. Technology, ingenuity, and modernization can help WIC reach families in, more, in a more equitable way. But we do need your help. Fundamental change is on the horizon and we're not gonna get there alone. Moms, babies, and young children deserve the best, the most nutritious start. Uh, and so that we can help ensure great things await them in their futures. And technology is really a key component to realizing these goals. Um, it's not an end in, in of itself. We have to modernize WIC, but remember the goal is to serve people better. And I do believe the work that you all are doing is just deeply rooted in that goal, which is uh, what do our customers want? What did your participants want? What will most meet their needs? Oh my goodness, I am truly having some trouble here today. <laughs> um, so, and I do think your research, you all will be able to move faster pivot uh, perhaps than we will. And uh, uh, your expertise is just so crucial to this goal. So we value your partnership. We want you to keep sharing your research, your ideas, your perspective. And also we wanna hear from you on how we're doing, right? You will be an important, your perspective, perspective in addition fundamentally to WIC participants will be a key proof point. So mothers, infants and young children across America are counting on us. So let's forge ahead together. Appreciate being you the opportunity to be here. And I understand you may wanna ask some questions but I also don't know how you're doing on time. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stacy, for sharing what USDA is doing to meet the moment and to work on modernizing WIC, you know, with technology to make this a hybrid program, uh, as we've talked about with in-person services as, as well. But um, everyone on this call, hundreds of people on this call, want to be your partners to ensure the success and the strength of this program, uh, you know, in this new century. Um, we are going to take some questions. Uh, thank you for addressing the infant formula shortage as well. Um, so let's open the floor. Angela, do you have some questions for us? Yes, we have time for about two questions. The first is for Stacy. Can Stacy speak to immediate actions USDA has taken to address formula shortage and what areas of the country women use WIC benefits for this the most? Sure. So um, first off, I would say it is a whole of government approach. This isn't an issue that just affects WIC participants, um, right? Uh, there's a shortage issues regardless of uh, whether you're on WIC or not. Um, so we're working with FDA, HHS, Department of Transportation, DOD. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of things going on. One is uh, trying to expedite uh, formula from overseas that was already planned to come in. Let's say, uh, and this happened this weekend. Gerber or Nestle has an overseas factory. It was planned to come in. We used USDA Department of Defense carriers to get it here faster. And that was medical formula. HHS is working with Nestle and Federal Express to distribute that across the country to get it to babies with particular medical needs because that's where we were seeing the most acute shortage. Uh, and then um, I guess I would say more just so Big, the big top line answer is we are working to increase supply dramatically. That's the best first solution. And then to uh, target really high need supply to those places that need it uh, first. So uh, let me just stop there and see if um, that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Next question we have, what are specific strategies on increasing awareness to WIC? And that's to both of you. Dr. Blumenthal, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I think one of the things is to really use, uh, as we talked about, digital outreach campaigns from other federal assistance programs, as well as using community organizations, community health clinics, uh, parents' organizations, children's organizations, to raise awareness about, um, you know, WIC's impact and services. I think that's really important. Text messaging, I think, as you mentioned, as uh, Stacey, you know, has been found to be a very effective tool to alert people to WIC. And I think we need to explore other in innovations that would work as well. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that, but let me underscore one or two aspects of it. So the idea of in-reach, for example, uh, identifying pregnant women, infants, or toddlers, say, in Medicaid and, and letting them know about WIC, I think is important. But I also think that um, setting performance, met uh, performance metrics, expectations, and then assessing how you're doing is important. So every governor uh, can ask their Department of Health or Human Services, how many families who are WIC eligible do we have on Medicaid? And how many of them are enrolled in WIC? I'd like a report on that every month. I think advocates and public health professionals can do the same. You can set the expectation of your local government that they're doing everything they can to support infants and toddlers with the critical nutrition benefits of WIC. My guess is that they may not have been asked about this before, right? That, uh, I think these are, incredi they are incredibly powerful programs. They're widely understood to be beneficial, uh, but they may just not appreciate that there's an incredibly large, no, there's a large share of eligibles on uh, Medicaid or SNAP who aren't enrolled in WIC. So that to me is very motivating and we need to set the expectation that there should be no gap there. And then you set the strategies around how to identify and find them. And of course, we wanna make the product even better, right? We wanna make the experience better. We wanna make it more responsive to today's moms and what they need and what we learned during COVID. And of course, uh, connecting to individuals through their community and people they trust. So I'm See, on board with all of this. Stacey, I wanted to ask you, you know, the waivers really help to accelerate some of the, the recommendations that we've pointed out. Um, do you, what are, you, what are your expectations about making these waivers permanent and also online ordering? You know, that's sort of the holy grail in terms of letting uh, with parents uh, shop like other people do. Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think a lot of the waivers that, and I think what you're there, you're talking about are the COVID waivers that right. uh, where we eased up on uh, some of the in-person requirements, for example, right. we're very interested in sorting out which of those we can keep and carry forward. And in some cases that will be, um, we, we have the ability to do that with these innovation funds, and we're going to need to talk to Congress about carrying that flexibility forward. But then also um, with respect to um, online shopping, let me just, we should end on that note. We 100% agree that that, uh, that option needs to be available for WIC participants. We want all of the uh, shopping benefits that any, any shopper has to be extended to our WIC families. So that's top of mind for us. And you'll be hearing more on that very, uh, from us very soon. Great. Well, I want to thank you so much, Stacey, for, for joining us, for sharing your perspectives. Our thanks also to Secretary Vilsack for his commitment. And, you know, just to let the audience know that in September, the White House will be convening the first uh, conference on uh, hunger, nutrition, and health in 50 years. And we know that child nutrition will be an important piece of the discussions at that meeting. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Well, um, we're now going to move to our panel discussion where we've brought together diverse experts to talk about the progress that's been made in terms of implementing some of the technology innovations we've been discussing, as well as future directions uh, for this field. And to moderate our discussion, um, I'm very proud to introduce to you an incredibly innovative scientist. I think he's a Renaissance man, Dr. David Kahn who is a synthetic biologist, a community organizer, a musician, and a photographer who currently serves as the director of the MIT Media Labs Community Biotechnology Initiative. David is also a leader in the global community bio movement, which aims to democratize biotechnologies and enable diverse communities around the world to learn about and innovate with the life sciences. David is going to moderate our panel and discuss the progress and promise of technology innovations in WIC. David. Susan, thank you so, so much for the kind introduction. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here with you all. Again, my name is David Sun Kong. I direct the Community Biotechnology Initiative at the Media Lab at MIT. Um, as we've been hearing already over the past um, hour plus, um, I personally am so, uh, so impressed to learn so much about the, the power and impact of the WIC program. And obviously there's some really significant challenges, uh, both in the awareness of the program, how do we increase enrollment, how do we increase retention? And so obviously technology and innovations are a really key factor in how we can address each of these different areas. 
And so we're really, really excited to be joined by um, a number of expert panelists and speakers who are each going to share some opening remarks, and then we'll go into a larger discussion together as a group. And so um, again, uh, we'd really love to, before we start, uh, thank Dr. Susan Blumenthal, New America, uh, the MIT Media Lab, and the Harvard uh, Department of Nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan Public School of Health, and also to the Red Rockefeller Aetna Foundation for all of their support. And so, um, again, as we've been discussing uh, throughout today, there was also a summit that was convened in 2017, the 50% summit. And so we'll hear a little bit from one of our panelists about that event as well. And so today we're incredibly honored to be joined by a number of, uh, of wonderful experts. So we have with us uh, Hildreth Englund, who is a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, Hildreth is a social designer working across scale sectors and industries to build more inclusive, equitable, equitable systems by design. And she led the communication strategy and research on inclusive design at the MIT Media Lab. Hildreth is gonna share some uh, thoughts about uh, the co-design efforts that were involved in the 50% Summit. Uh, we also have joining us uh, Rachel Colchamiro, who serves as the director of the nutrition division of the Massachusetts Department of Health. And Rachel has tremendous expertise and insight in the WIC program in Massachusetts. So really excited, uh, Rachel, to hear from you. Uh, up next, we also have Jennifer Loyo, who's the co-founder and principal consultant of Lime Tree Research, which is a dynamic women and minority owned public health research and evaluation consulting firm based in Austin, Texas. She and her co-founder drew inspiration from their work on research projects for the Texas WIC program uh, in her graduate school experience. So Jennifer, welcome. And we're so excited to hear you talk about WIC in this context of your work in Texas. Um, up next, we have uh, Amanda Renteria, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Code for America. And again, um, Amanda is, has a real tremendous resume. Uh, she previously was the Chief, op uh, Chief of Operations at the California Department of Justice. Uh, served as the national political director for Secretary Clinton during the 2016 presidential campaign, and was also the first Latina chief of staff in the history of the United States Senate. So, um, Amanda, it's a true honor to have you here as well, and we're very excited to hear about uh, your reflections uh, about WIC uh, from your role as CEO of Code for America. And finally, we have joining us um, Harry Zhang, who's a professor of community environmental health at Old Dominion University. Uh, Harry received his PhD in economics from the University of Alabama in 2001, and most recently won the Gene W. Hirschfeld Faculty Excellence Award, and also does uh, uh, specializes and does research in WIC, and will speak about uh, some of what's happened uh, with the program so far, and also its future directions. So um, to each of our panelists, we're so thrilled and honored to have you. Each of you has got um, a very short uh, set of remarks to give first, so we'll, I'll introduce you individually to give your remarks, and then we'll switch over into the discussion. So to kick things off, um, Hildreth, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, three minutes to talk about uh, your experiences with the 50% conference. Thanks, David. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me here, Dr. B. Um, I have to tell you that it was, a, it was a little bit more than five years ago. I was sitting in my office and I got this text telling me to come to the director's office of the Media Lab immediately um, to join a phone call. And I had no idea what the phone call was about. But after a few minutes, I was listening to this kind passionate, informed voice on the line advocating for a more modern WIC, and I got really excited. Uh, and I got excited because I knew WIC really well. First, as a dietitian, I used to work for WIC as a dietitian, and then I was an engagement specialist with Texas WIC. So I was developing mobile apps and websites and materials and classes for WIC moms and their families. And then I got a little starstruck because I got introduced to Dr. B for the first time and Dr. Willett. And as a community nutrition dietitian, I think of Dr. B and Walt Willett as the Mick Jagger and the Debbie Harry of the public health nutrition world. So I stay excited because over the course of many months through 2016, 2017, and then into the future, I got to bring lots of disciplines together, my own, and then also others uh, at the Media Lab, human-centered design and nutrition and technology for a program about which I've long been passionate and had lots of experience. Um, and so it was through the extraordinary efforts of Dr. B and Dr. Willett and IDEO and this whole team, we got to put together uh, the 50% conference in 2017. And that conference was ahead of its time for so many reasons, because we not only wrangled the faculty at the Media Lab and Media Lab students and uh, Walmart and Amazon, Facebook VPs and designers and nonprofit leaders, um, but also, and this is really important, we went to great lengths to make sure, to make it possible, but not only possible, possible, probable that WIC families and WIC local staff and WIC state staff could participate meaningfully in that conference. 
And so this inclusive experience design was intentional and the co-design uh, participatory design aspect of it was also innovative. Um, we knew we needed WIC families and staff's lived experience on this explore of the Media Lab, in addition to the multi-sector, multidisciplinary, multi-scaled event, um, this expertise that we were bringing into the room to talk about WIC's modern future. So that 2017 conference kickstarted a whole bunch of things, not least of which is the symposium. Um, I got to build out a small research project focusing on bringing this inclusive spirit into the Media Lab and today, I'm really excited that this excitement, my own personal excitement, but the excitement for this project continues and that it's continuing in this inclusive, uh, forward-thinking way. Um, the symposium is, is important for lots of reasons, but I'm so glad that it's bringing this progress and promise of the WIC program out to so many people, but also bringing so many people into it. Um, so I think it's important to just acknowledge that it was a super exciting time and it's it's living on and I'm so excited to be here. Hildreth, wonderful. Thank you so much for your remarks. And again, I think um, this notion of community engagement and how we can all work together collaboratively to um, both develop and implement solutions, I think is probably a really core um, a value that this uh, community really uh, appreciates very much. So thank you. And um, up next, I'd like to introduce again, uh, Rachel Colchamiro, who again serves as the director, director of the Nutrition Division uh, of the Massachusetts Department of Health to share a little bit about her perspective on WIC in the state of Massachusetts. So Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Thanks to Dr. Blumenthal and everyone for inviting me and including me in this event. It's very exciting. I know I have just a few minutes um, and I just wanted to share a little bit about what we're, we're doing in technology, but I know it's not just Massachusetts, states across the country have been working on technology advancement and innovation for years in partnership with USDA and the National WIC Association. But I can share what we're doing here locally and then provide you some resources at the end to learn more through the National WIC Association about what other states might be doing and recommendations for the future. Next. So just a little bit about Massachusetts. We're serving um, quite a few folks and in 2021, nearly 183,000 unique individuals accessed WIC in Massachusetts. And we're serving about 42% um, of all the babies in this state. We do utilize online EBT and we have since 2014 and we have um, almost 850 retailers that can uh, transact WIC benefits. Next. So we have a lot of technology and we use it all the time and the pandemic has definitely um, provided impetus to use it even more and in different ways. We have a web-based information system that we can access from cl clinic and from home for staff that are working remotely. We do have online staff access to Medicaid eligibility and immunization registry portals, which allow us to determine eligibility remotely and also to ensure that we are providing good immunization education and referral information. We have online EBT, we utilize the WIC Shopper app, including a real-time benefit balance feature that is super helpful for families. And we also communicate through it widely all the time. And it also houses lots of nutrition education information and referral information. We use an online nutrition education system called WIC Smart. We use Teletask to, use, um, to implement statewide texting and local program texting and one-on-one -on -one participant staff communication all the time. It also reminds folks of reminders about appointments. And we use an online pre-application, which uh, collects information from folks and brings it right into EOS, which is our management information system for easy application processes. Next. We do do lots of digital marketing campaigns through Facebook, geofencing, and other media placements. And we drive all of that traffic right to our online free application so folks can apply really easily and get in, co in contact with the local program that serves their zip code. And we do have um, extensive data sharing agreements, both with Medicaid, we call it MassHealth in Massachusetts, and SNAP to identify folks who are likely eligible but not participating. And we reach out to them after matching them against our database with text messages that provide information about the benefits of WIC and link them right to our online free application. Next. This is an example of when we do our quarterly data matching campaigns, both for SNAP and MassHealth, and every peak that you see in our online applications is directly related to a text messaging campaign that began that week. Next. We added some more technology strategies during the pandemic that I wanted to highlight briefly. We greatly increased the utilization of our WIC Shopper app for participant communication, nutrition education, and WIC program information, including required forms and releases that are available to participants through the app. We enhanced utilization of teletask-friendly reports to be able to identify specific families that we needed to reach out to and be able to communicate with them easily through text. 
We obviously increased our remote service delivery and telehealth options. We authorized self-checkout lanes at a variety of our retailers. We participated in the Hannaford to go curbside pickup online ordering platform. And we enhanced our interpreter services options to allow for scheduling of different um, and hard to find uh, interpreter services and for a video appointment telehealth um, interpreter services as well. Next. We learned a lot of lessons during the pandemic, but we have seen that the ease of access has led to significant improvements in child retention. We are continuing to focus on supporting families with the WIC shopping process. Uh, we've noticed that we need, um, with our remote service delivery, more options for third-party interpretation services. We need more solutions for video telehealth services that are easily um, embraced by staff and participants. And we do need more solutions for enhanced data sharing and a collaboration with healthcare providers to allow for a timely nutrition assessment and require data collection for follow-up and WIC. Next. Just want to tell you where we're going next. We are one of the three awardees in partnership with Washington State for the WIC online ordering project that is funded by USDA and managed through the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition in collaboration with Washington, Walmart, and CDPFIS EBT processors. We are working on some digital document storage upload capacity through our WIC Shopper app and through scanning at the WIC office to allow for electronic maintenance of required documents for eligibility. We are thinking about how to enhance our MIS system to directly link to our MassHealth uh, eligibility portal, to the Massachusetts Immunization Registry, and to our WIC Smart Online Education System. And we are planning to work with our partners at the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture to explore these solutions for a WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Next. And just to follow up for more information, I strongly recommend visiting the National WIC Association's, WIC Association's webpage and the hub, the WICHub.org, which allows you to see what other states are doing and to learn about recommendations of the association. And for more information about the online ordering project, the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition page is there, as well as our WIC page for Massachusetts WIC. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Rachel, that was like a perfectly timed five minutes. That was <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Thank you for keeping us on time. And uh, up next, uh, to bring us some perspectives from the state of Texas, I'm really, really pleased to be joined by Jennifer Loya. So Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And first of all, I want, I want to thank y'all for inviting me to participate in this panel. I'm very honored to be here. And I want to talk a little bit about not only the technology use that is being that is happening in Texas, but I've also had the opportunity to work with other programs across the nation and I did reach out to them to find out what they were doing and what were their immediate needs. And um, I want to talk to about those as well. Um, next slide please. So first of all, I wanted to start off by saying that. WIC helps address equity by providing nutritious foods to low-income families, by preventing nutrition-related illness and enhancing health outcomes, and that is super, super important. WIC is also culturally, ethnically, and racially diverse and serves participants with a wide range of traditional food preferences. And they actually changed their food packages back in about 10 years ago now um, to allow for more food foods and to address these um, culturally, and ethnically, and racially diverse foods that people were eating. Um, also, the programs are incorporating many of the mainstream technologies that we that we use every day to increase and maintain program participation, as we saw with what Massachusetts is doing. Next slide, please. Okay, current technology use includes like the telehealth, telewic, texting participants, not only program information, but also advice. And they've also have found unique ways to use texting to um, increase participation for participants ages 18 months, or well, actually they enroll them at 12 months. And we have a project here in Texas that's doing that. That's enrolling participants from 12 months to 36 months. This project right now is in a pilot and um, we're noticing that we are having a very little drop off and participants are really enjoying that. Um, we also have interfaces with other programs such as Medicaid and SNAP that is used to meet the eligibility requirements such as uh, Massachusetts was talking about. They are also, some programs are also are now having uh, or being able to do some document uploads, uploads through the teletask. They text participants the documents that they need and the participant can text back the document. The only problem with teletask though is that uh, the staff person has to go in the back end to pull out that document and then connect it to the MIS. They also have, um, we have two types of, on, we have online and offline states that were the benefits the, um, for the EBT cards. 
This means that in an offline state, the, the benefit is stored on the card. That information is stored on the card, whereas in the online states, it's stored in the network system. Um, so the online states have the capacity to issue WIC benefits remotely, which was very useful during the pandemic with the use of the physical presence waiver. They were um, one of our programs um, that I talked to told me that they were able to even to do batch uh, batches of uh, uh, to deliver those benefits, which was very useful. Um, other programs are starting to use live online nutrition education sessions. Texas has um, some live online classes. And then um, they also have a WIC shopping app for locating the correct foods at the store and checking WIC benefits online and, and through the app before they would have to um, ask at the store. And that was kind of cumbersome. Next slide, please. Um, also now Texas is part of a state that is testing another app and they're starting to design, test, and implement more sophisticated apps that allow participants to enroll online. They can upload documents directly on this app. They can answer their health history questionnaires. They can make an appointment, cancel it, and reschedule it. And right now they're trying and testing new features that are being developed and tested right now as we speak. One of those, which is really important for the formula, would be to be able to um, do a formula exchange right, in, right through the app. This is just currently now, like I said, it's just in a testing phase. They're also testing online remote. Um, there are some programs, as um, Massachusetts mentioned, that are testing online remote shopping using eWIC. Um, and then we also have social media presence, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. They're also using the new technology that these apps have, such as Reels, live sessions. There's a wonderful session called Coffee with a Dietitian that where they can ask dietitians different questions that they have regarding feeding their children. And there are also these uh, program managers are doing food and cooking demos for their, for their clients. Um, and Texas has some innovation centers where these programs are actually testing these technologies and innovations. Next slide, please. Now, what technology needs would the, these programs want? They're speaking about this online shopping use using the WIC ABT card. They also want an integrated medical record or WIC record that is like a, the standard EMR such as EPIC that would allow for file exchange directly from the healthcare provider. Some programs already have the interfaces with other programs such as Medicaid and SNAP used to meet eligibility requirements, but not all of them, especially the tribal organizations. Um, they're not really part of the state, so this is, it requires some extra steps in order to get that to happen. Programs are also having to use multiple technologies such as DocuSign, Teletask, WixSmart, online pre-application systems to get the job done. They would like to have a way to integrate those technologies with their MIS and just have one. Next slide, please. They would also like secure ways to upload documents, chat and telehealth visits. Um, use technology to obtain healthcare providers, provider authorizations for different formulas and even provide general issuance of a formula. So for example, if I have a premature baby that I don't have to have the exact brand of a premature formula, such as like Neosure, I could have both Neosure and Emphacare, which is one is a Similac brand and the other is the Enfamil brand, or maybe just a general issuance of a, just a premature formula so that we don't have to go back to the healthcare provider to obtain that authorization. And they would also like to support supporting the continued development of these apps to facilitate enrollment and program logistics for current participants including the possibility of allowing for the document upload, the formula exchange that I talked about, and the chat between the participant and the eWIC staff. This I heard, this last piece I heard from um, testing of the Texas WIC app where participants would love to be able to chat when they have an issue with one of the WIC um, staff members. Next slide, please. And Jennifer, I'm so sorry, but if you don't mind, I'm just wrapping up your remarks shortly. Thank you so much. Yes, really quick. I just want to really quickly talk about this formula recall and the supply chain uses program. So we're allowing participants to purchase alternative brand formulas, which was really helpful. They changed the UPC codes on the back end. Um, on, online states were able to do it at the store, whereas the offline states, the participants had to come in the clinic. One of the things that one of the states was doing was using Tableau to find where the recently purchased formulas were so that they could use this information to find where formulas were being processed. Next slide, please. Purchase, sorry. And what they could, what would, could have helped in this instance would have been a national formula inventory um, where they, we could, where vendors could upload what it would, could share basically what, um, in, what formulas they had 
we could rely, relay this information to participants so they could be more successful in finding formula for their infants. And then having an easier and more efficient way to get the health care provider association for the infant, especially for those that are impacted by the recall and the supply chain. And then finally changing the issues like I already talked about. And I know now that they do drop ship um, some of the formulas uh, especially the specialized products, but I think it would be great if we could start drop shipping any formula to participants. And that is all. Thank you very much. Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And again, we'll come back and talk about the formula shortage. And I think um, both your, your and uh, Rachel's uh, specific insights from your respective states, I think has been really valuable. So uh, thank you for sharing. And um, up next, it's a real honor and pleasure to introduce Amanda Renteria, who is the CEO for Code for America. So Amanda, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and bienvenidos a todos. Welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> it is wonderful to be here with you. Uh, from a personal level, I grew up in one of the lowest income uh, congressional districts in the country, and the meaning of this kind of work is real for communities all across America. And so from a personal level, thank you very much. Um, from a perspective of policy and politics and where we are in this country, I also want to thank you because so much of the work that when I was on the Hill, for nine years fighting for policies or when I was in politics trying to win hearts and minds, um, this is the kind of work that makes a real difference. And now at Code for America, I get a chance to actually work on the systems themselves. And to give you a sense of the perspective that Code for America brings, we have been in this work for 11 years. Um, most notably, um, we were actually at the first um, WIC um, uh, conference and has really given us a foundation for how we think about human-centered government all across um, the country in all kinds of different programs. Our most notable work that's really adjacent to this is we were the first mobile app in Spanish and English for the child tax credit. We launched with the White House and the Treasury and we were able to bring a lot of these ideas and things that uh, discussed here on this call to the forefront in order to reach people who had never been reached before by the tax system or frankly from any benefits programs. Um, we, but that has been our most recent work our work that we've been in for 11 years is really around the safety net. Everything from food assistance to WIC to uh, integrated benefits. Our most recent integrated benefits project was in Minnesota, where we not only cut down the time from, I think it was like 48 hours to, or something like that when you go through it, to 12 minutes, where you can, uh, you can apply for nine different safety net benefits. And for the first time ever, Minnesota was able, to, uh, was able to coordinate with all its sovereign tribal nations in order to have a seamless, smooth process. And so um, the work we're most excited about, and this really leads me to why this kind of conversation is so important, is we really are at that window now where we can start to have real systems change, not just in a crisis, but really foundationally. And so we were excited just two weeks ago to, to launch um, an announcement of $100 million to transform the safety net across the country. And the idea around that is really focused on how do we make sure SNAP, WIC, integrated benefits are able to, to really work for the kind of communities we have today, um, thinking human-centered design at the beginning, being able to reach folks where they are, when they are, in the languages they speak, and really make a difference so that we are ready for a more uncertain world as we think about what we're going into in the future. Um, and I think not only the pandemic was a was a window into that, but also the infant um, the the formula that we're the formula crisis that we're handling now. More and more, if we can build those resilient systems, that not just matters for our country and our resiliency, but for those communities who have for, felt far too long that they've been left out. Finally, there are ways that technology can help to finally connect them um, in the, at a time when they are in crisis, but also at a time where our country really needs everyone to be able to manage through these uncertain times. So again, I just wanna end with saying thank you um, for having us on this call. We really appreciate the partnership we have with Stacey Deans, uh, Chairwoman Stabenow, my former boss, Secretary Vilsack. Um, this is the kind of work that gets us up every day at Code for America. And we can't, we can't tell you how excited we are to actually be a part of these kinds of discussions to move things forward. Amanda, that was amazing. Thank you so, so much. And again, I we're really looking forward to hearing more about your thoughts regarding systems change, infrastructure, both social and technological, and also some of your thoughts on co-design and community engagement. So thank you so much. 
And um, up next again, um, to close out our uh, presentation round, um, we're so thrilled to have joining us Harry Zhang, who's the professor of community environmental health at Old Dominion University. Um, and and uh, Harry, I think we want to thank you in particular for your special and dedicated leadership to the WIC team. I know you've been a, a really critical member of the team uh, pulling all of this together. So thank you so much for your leadership and I'll turn it over to you for 10 minutes of remarks. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited um, to uh, share some of my thoughts about why we want to develop a human-centered technology for WIC. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I just want to give it a, a limited time. I want to share like two stories. The first one called bounded rationality. The second one crossing the chasm. If you're not familiar with the term, totally fine. That's a purpose why we want to come here and uh, learn from each other. Right, next. Okay, so the bounded rationality, it's a, it's a kind of scientific concept, say you know, individuals is, have a limited rationality because we are not God. We cannot make optimal decision every, you know, every minute, anywhere. Okay, this is something you know, we, we have to live with. Next, but why this is related to WIC technology? Well, one quick key question, uh, for example, we talk about uh, like uh, the WIC app, like uh, Rachel talked about the WIC Shopper app, but can the WIC Shopper really improve the food benefit redemption rates? So we look at, we're using the West Virginia WIC EBD data in 2019, and we look at the 18 food benefits across the bas basket, and, and uh, we just calculate uh, the absolute difference um, in the redemption rate between app users and non-app users, right? Because even if it's the best technology, some people will never use it. So like in our group, we have like a, a, around like a two thirds using the Wix Shop app, but the, the one third not using the Wix app, uh, app shop, uh, Wix Shopper app. So we just look at the absolute difference between their redemption rates. But also, you know, kind of we can calculate the relative difference. See, compared to the, um, the non-app users, what the redemption rates can be improved or changed for the app users. Next slide. Wow, I mean, we have like 18 benefits, okay? And uh, not surprisingly, and although these uh, benefits are free, some benefits are very popular, like infant formula, um, but some benefits are not. For example, infant meat. I still remember when I was a young daddy 20 years ago, I personally tasted the infant meats. Uh, so frankly, it's not a good experience. Okay. So, and you can see uh, the, the redemption rates are different. Okay. So we just rank the redemption rates on average uh, from the lowest like infant meat to the highest infant formula. Okay. And the two easier, like, uh, like uh, to make it easier to, for you to recognize these benefits, we just divide this 18 benefit into three groups. The bottom six, I mark it red, is like a um, low redemption rate. The uh, middle group, six um, benefits, we call it like a medium redemption rate. And the, the, um, the, the highest redemption rate group uh, uh, highlighted with Green bars. Uh, just so this is a very very you know, arbitrary simple like a uh, kind of uh, grouping. Next. So then we, we we just look at the absolute difference in redemption rates. Okay, and the, the good news is the absolute difference uh, in redemption rates are all positive. What does that mean? That means on average the app users' redemption rates are higher than the redemption rates of non-app users, right? So this is a good news. But you know, for each benefit, they're different, okay? You know, for the infant formula, the absolute difference is like a 3.6 percentage points. And for the, uh, the fish, uh, the absolute difference is like a 14.3 percentage point, which means, you know, have a larger, like an increase. But if you look at the color, Okay, you know, forget about the numbers. Just look at the color. Oh, we don't see a, like a clear pattern. It's like a more like a shuffle. All right, now the magic moment comes. Go to next. So look at the relative difference. Okay, if you look at the, 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 the bars, it's amazingly, you know, all the red bars goes to the, the right, which means, you know what, the low redemption rates actually have a higher, um, you know, kind of relative increase uh, regards redemption rates. Okay, 
but what did that mean? You know, we see we see some pattern, but what did that mean? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we know participants make decisions with bounded rationality. What what what, what did that mean? Okay, so uh, I just you know, I know there are so many star people in the audience, and some of you are like a geniuses. Okay, and I just have a quick uh, a quiz for you. How many people can recall the 18 benefits I just showed in the previous three slides? And how many people can remember the redemption rates? So the numbers associated with these benefits, so raise your hand, okay? But think about the WIC participants. Uh, they have a, a, a infant to feed. They have a child to take care of. They have, may have two part-time jobs to, to do, and they have like a, a, a pandemic to fight with, but now we require them, hey, you know what? This is an EBD card, okay? You, your benefits is on the card. You cannot see the balance. You cannot see the transaction record. If you want, you have to call the 800 number or you print out the receipt, but you want to manage all the, risk, you know, the, the benefit redemption every, every week, every month. That's what we require them to do. So they can do what? Acceptable, but not optimal. Oh, you know what? Infant formula, this is a benefit I really want to get. I will make sure to redeem it. Infant means, yeah, if I remember, I will redeem it. But if I forgot, that's totally fine. So that's called acceptable, but not optimal. But how are we going to nudge with technology? So with the Wikshop app, if you check the balance, you know, it's, oh, you know what? I have the, I have the, uh, the balance to check. When you see the infant formula benefit, Oh, you know what? There's a, another benefit called infant meat. Why not just redeem at once? So this technology, the, 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 the cool part about the technology now is what? Reduce the cognitive load for the participants so they can easily remember easily. Oh, you know what? There's a benefit called infant meat, just redeem it. So this is the first story, tell us. Go next. Okay. Next called the crossing the chasm. What does that mean? Okay, go back. Uh, go to next slide. Okay, WIC online ordering is mentioned several times. Uh, and we look at a pilot program in uh, Oklahoma WIC online stores called the Primetime Nutrition. And we, uh, this is kind of a, like a pilot program. It's called online ordering, but like in-store pickup. So participants can order WIC foods on the store app and pick them up in store with an EBT card. So this is not a totally like an online ordering, you know, kind of, but it's a, like a, a pilot version. Go next. So this is the trends in new WIC online ordering. So they implemented the uh, WIC online ordering in July, 2020. And we look at the first six months of the new WIC online ordering, okay, the new customers. And originally we thought is what uh, everybody remember the, the chaotic time, you know, the end of the 2020, the, the COVID-19 numbers skyrocketing, you know, uh, supposedly we, we should be scared of the going out. We should be using more of the week online ordering, right? No. The number just showed the new online ordering is steadily what? Going down. Why? It's against our expectation. We're so passionate about the, the, the technology innovation, but we look at the data, only 5.4% of the WIC customer in the stores actually adopt or tried WIC online ordering. So this is very you know, against our intuition. We did like a thorough interview. Originally, you, know, you may say, oh, let's just blame the, the store and staff. We did an interview with the staff, um, did an interview with the management team, the technology director. They did a wonderful job. They did all the job they can to promote, to make the system working. But why only 5% were customers using the work online ordering? Okay, go to the next slide. So we dig into the literature and we find that there's an interesting uh, theory called the crossing the chasm. So this is a marketing theory to say, hey, you know what, for all the technology innovation, we, feel, uh, we face different consumers. There are some people uh, like in the, in the consumer group called the techies or visionaries, like the folks from MIT. They may just use you know, whatever the technology come up, they say, oh, you know, let's try it. But the majority of the market in the, the consumer base is what? They're conservative, they are skeptics. They will using the technology innovation until you know, most people say, oh, you know, it's great. Let's try, try it out. If you don't believe it, look at your phone. 
how many apps you downloaded, uh, tried a few times, and then you never use again. Uh, just they sit quietly on the phone. So this is a, like a theory called the crossing the chasm regarding the technology innovation. Next. Right, so this is a complicated model. So we developed for the work online ordering. Okay. And then we did an uh, interview with the participants. We look at the data using the, uh, you know, kind of the um, uh, statistical analysis to, uh, to ensure we understand the, the, the problem. Okay, originally, you know, if we have the technology, it will it, it easily transit to the, um, uh, to the like, a, uh, like a major market, everybody will accept it, but no. Okay, there are so many factors in the system that can potentially prevent that diffusion. Okay, the lack of awareness, okay, lack of interpersonal communication, lack of the, the resource support from the other, uh, um, you know, different agencies, all these things create a big chasm. So our goal is now what? Not only develop the, the technology innovation, is to crossing the chasm together. Next. So this is what we call the human-centered work. Okay, we are looking to the future. Whenever we build a, develop a technology, we really need to put the participant, put the people in the center. Okay, because the, the technology can, is, is there, but how are we gonna develop a technology adopted by these people, by the participants, serve them? This is a significant question for researchers, for the agency, for all the stakeholders. It's not easy, okay? When we design, when we evaluate, we have to definitely make sure we keep the mindset is not the technology is the center, but the people is the center. And when we develop this kind of uh, like a technology uh, in WIC, especially we have to understand, you know, they may have a very different uh, life experience, maybe different uh, like uh, bandwidth like us. Now we can sit in you know, comfortably in a conference room and talk something very high tech, but they are living maybe in a low uh, income neighborhood facing the street crimes, have to, you know, uh, risk their lives to do multiple like uh, jobs, okay? But, but this is, a, a very, very important mindset that we have to adopt when we develop a design or evaluate this, uh, this kind of technology uh, innovations in WIC. Next. Okay, easy said than done. All right. And I still remember like uh, 10 years, I was at the, uh, the base camp of Mount Everest. Okay, I never ever, you know, to think I, I'm gonna reach that level, but I know how hard even you kind of stay at the base camp. It's, I think 17,000 feet, yeah, it's, it's pretty, you know, kind of a crazy level. But after like a few years working with, I realized I encountered more like a failures than success, right? And I realized this is a tough job. Uh, this is not something, you know, one person or one team can do it together. I really appreciate I have the opportunity to work with so many wonderful people from multiple state agency, from like a app developed JPMA, from the store owners, primetime nutrition, my team at the ODU, and also my funding agencies from Duke. You know, the HER uh, program is wonderful to support this innovative, sometimes you know, we call high risk, like a, uh, like a project, okay. But today I feel very excited because I heard so many, you know, stakeholders are willing to stand up and form a united, like a front line to conquer the technology innovation in WIC, you know. It's not easy to do, but sometimes say, because it's hard, because it's challenging, we want to come together to make a better WIC program with modernized technology for women, infants, and children because they are the future of our nation. Thank you. Wonderful, Harry, thank you so, so much for your remarks and for all of your uh, comments and your presentations. Um, I have the uh, unfortunate role of trying to fit as many questions as we can and probably into 15 minutes. So um, I, I hope it's all right for everybody if we go about 10 minutes after the hour. And again, I apologize. We'll have to keep your question, your uh, responses brief if you can. Um, but uh, again, I am really looking forward to this discussion. So I'd like to start first with uh, Rachel and Jennifer. Again, thank you both for sharing your perspectives from Massachusetts and Texas. Um, one big theme we've heard all day throughout the day has been around data. 
right? And I think, um, you know, one question that I have for both of you is, um, in both your presentations, you shared a lot of different types of interventions that you're working on in both of your states. Um, could you talk a little bit about how data plays a role? And are you able to kind of, um, you know, pick one key intervention that you feel like has the data shown to be particularly successful in your states? That's the first question. And then secondly, you know, if you sort of had a magic wick wand and could create, you know, a technology that you think would be really, really impactful, uh, what do you think that might be? So Rachel, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Jennifer. Goodness. Um, we use data all the time, um, especially in the EBT space, that um, having our data available to us through our CDP processor is just amazing. It's been super helpful during this formula shortage, and it was helpful in evaluating our cash value benefit increase. Um, we used data uh, initially when we talked about our data exchanges with MassHealth to see if text messaging would improve folks' online application process, and it did, and that's why we went forward with it and also uh, continued on to have that partnership with SNAP. Um, so data is super important. We have an epidemiologist assigned to us and we use it all the time. We use we have a needs assessment where we match against births and look to see who's accessing WIC and who doesn't and what are the um, characteristics of populations that aren't signing up. Um, but if I had a WIC magic wand, <laughs> oh man, I don't know. I mean, we're really excited about the online shopping experience, but it is a challenging process. Mm. The WIC transaction is not simple. And I think that that's hard to grasp if you're not familiar with the program. And so um, I think uh, making it through that, demonstrating how we can make that work in different types of retailers across this project with Gretchen Swanson will be super exciting and open up a lot of opportunity for families. So I think that's my magic wand. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Wonderful. Um, Jennifer, uh, back to you. Yeah, so we do a lot of mixed methods of um, qualitative and quantitative research for, for Texas WIC specifically, and we've done it also for other programs. And I think that that work helps really to with the implementation of projects. So they're doing like, that's part of our work with the innovation centers is, you know, going out and speaking to participants and seeing how those innovations are, are being perceived and accepted. Same thing goes with the Texas WIC, uh, the, the app that they're developing with other states. Um, so I think that we, we talk about more about that lived experience and how participants are being able to interact with that technology. Um, and then for the the magic wand, I guess I have to agree with Rachel. I think the online uh, the online shopping is the, probably one of the priorities for the participants and the program. So that's great. And and one other follow up, Amanda. I'm going to hop to you in a second. But um, one other follow up for both of you. Um, one thing that struck me throughout the day, but also in both of your remarks as well, it just feels like there's so much that the states could be doing to learn from each other and not be reinventing the wheel. And so I'm wondering if you both could comment a little bit about, um, you know, either prospects for collaboration or ways that um, we can better share these insights across all of these different programs that are being developed. I'm happy to start like, a, yeah. um, from my perspective. So um, we have lots of opportunities to do that. We, we all work within our regions very collaboratively, all the more so since the pandemic. And so we share innovation all the time. Um, we work with various states who have the same um, contractors, processors, uh, WIC app vendors, and we work together to like share best practices. And then the National WIC Association brings together a lot of folks to work together through conferences or special task forces. Um, and so there is a lot of opportunity. I feel like we all are constantly learning from each other and not necessarily recreating the wheel. That's great. Jennifer, do you have anything quick you want to add to that? I, I just have to agree with Rachel. I think what she said was Perfect. <laughs> okay, great. And Amanda, I know you wanted to chime in on this thread as well. I've got a separate question for you too, but, but why don't you go ahead first to, thought, to pick you up on this thread? Yeah, just two things. Um, the cohort modeling is exactly right. We were involved with the pandemic EBT with about 10 different states. And the conversation that happened around the table was absolutely critical. Everything from just how data worked across things to even understanding the legality of what was legal and what wasn't legal was incredibly useful. And then when we actually did the after debrief, um, the biggest the biggest chance for flexibility were those states that had data data interactions already and data cleanliness already. And so that was our number one barrier when we started to work with 10 states across the country to go clean this up first, and then let's identify the legalities of this, and then let's build best practices. And so it's absolutely critical for states as we think through this going forward. 
Fabulous. And, and Amanda, I, I wanted to just follow up again on some of your remarks. Um, you know, you made a, a pretty, um, I thought, um, a, a really uh, statement that woke me up a lot thinking about systems. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about what you meant by kind of systems change and infrastructure. Like, is there a particular type of system that you're talking about? Um, and then um, what are the, the ways that you might uh, try to address those changes within that system? Yeah. A lot of our conversation that we have at Code for America is we can see this gap, whether it's WIC or it's SNAP or it's automatic record clearance, we're also in that work or tax benefits. And we basically say, all right, what right now, let's take just what exists now, not changing the policy, not changing anything about it. And how do we actually bring down a barrier? Mm -hmm. Right. And there are kind of three things that we we've started to surface. Number one is actually just trust. Right. How does a system actually grab you? Right. Is it asking, are you a criminal when you walk into the room? And some of our benefits actually, in fact, do that. And if you do that, you lose people off the top. Right. The second is what kind of language are you using? So it's not just about being welcoming, but then you get to the next step, which is, are you simple? And are you using the kind of language that your end users understand that the people you're really trying to reach understand? That's a second piece that pretty much every uh, every system can benefit on and it will evolve over time. And then the third is meeting folks where they are. So it is absolutely true when we talk about mobile first, it matters. Not just that you're taking a paper form to a website um, to make that easier, but actually starting mobile first makes a real difference, particularly for the folks that we are trying to reach. And then lastly is as we make these changes, how do we make sure that these systems changes are also impacting the way public servants themselves are able to better and more smoothly reach the clients they serve. Because remember on the back end, when it comes in, you have public servants who some of these cases are piling up, right? And if we can make it a little bit smoother where now we can understand the barriers or why things get stuck, where you need a human or a public servant to actually reach it out and work it out. If we can actually reduce that pile, we're all better for it. And so that's sort of the methodical way we, we talk through or think through program by program. That's really, really inspiring. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Um, Harry, I wanna go with you, uh, return to you for two questions. Um, the first question, again, going back on this theme on, on data, um, you know, I really appreciated in your, um, your presentation, the various ways in which you sorted uh, you know, the different data and how that really revealed what was effective and not effective for the various WIC programs that you're working on. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about data innovations. And you know, um, earlier, uh, Senator Blunt uh, was talking as well about this idea of real-time data, and could that actually influence policy more quickly Quickly. I was wondering if you had any quick reflections about uh, that, uh, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, I, I think you know uh, one thing we, we, we need to remember the uh, the WIC is kind of regulated the program, right? Yeah, you know everybody wants the data, we want the data sharing, but still, you know, I'm, I'm learned. I, I deal with like a multiple state agency and they get uh, kind of help them with the data. But one thing I learned, we we definitely need to how to know uh, dancing with the shackles on. Okay, so yeah, you, 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 you want the data, but you know, you may get the data very differently across different states. Okay, some people, will, some will give you a, a group, uh, but some will get individual transactions. Uh, so this is a data accessibility. The second one is, I, I, I don't think it's a data issue. I think it's a talent issue. So the data is sitting there, but whether we can have talents to uh, you know, interpret these kind of data scientists that you know, kind of uh, the, the real person who can interpret tell a good story. That's a totally different dimension. So I think, uh, like I said, to Brandon, uh, good comments. When the FDA shut down these uh, facilities, if you have the data, you should you know, kind of a very simple projection. You will predict there is a shortage of prices coming, right? But there is no like uh, alarming signals from uh, these agencies. So I think the data is important. The data is wonderful, but the, we require tremendous, like uh, many you know, talents, uh, researchers, uh, stakeholders work together to let the data to tell a good story. So that's my comment. Wonderful. And, and just to follow up again, and we've only got about five, six minutes left. Um, I, I want to spend a little time on this theme of human-centered design and community engagement, which has come up a number of times. And again, I, I really appreciate the comment as earlier as well about trust, which is I think is also very much connected to this notion of human design and uh, community engagement. Um, Harry, I'll start with you first. You, you again spent a bunch of slides uh, talking about that. Can you share a little bit more about um, sort of innovations that we can create in human-centered design and how we can better apply those frameworks for WIC? I I think, you know, uh, 
Well, not not, not for, for work per se, but the uh, the industry is a very very smart. Uh, for example, we are doing a, like a, a systematic review on the online online marketing strategies. In the marketing industry, they have already built very very smart technology to predict your shopping behaviors. Uh, the famous uh, the famous case is the target that send what the formula to a teenager girl. Uh, even the, their parents don't know that the, the, te uh, the teenager is, is pregnant, right? This is, you know, kind of the human sense technology. We have to be very careful what, what, what does that mean? All right. But we, we have the technology, we have the algorithm, but we need to be very careful to using the right um, technology for the right people. Uh, so this is kind of say, even we talk about the human centered, but we have to using the right, right framework for the human center. We want to serve them we want to make them better but we don't want what like uh, take advantage of this human being so this is so crucial in the in the design and so Heldreth, i'll turn it over to you to share a little bit more as well i, I know you played obviously a critical role in the uh, human and community center design aspects of the 50 percent uh uh, conference. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about how you believe that um, this type of a framework could be used uh, going forward in the future yeah, I think it's interesting because uh, human-centered design leaves out some of the humaneness of um, of being inclusive and being participatory in events like the 50% conference or in any development or design process where you're asking people to come to the table and help you think through how a technology can serve them. Um, for example, you know, putting people at the center of the design process is is human-centered. But I think what was interesting at the 50% conference was that there were many solutions that came out of that conversation or those discussions that didn't involve technology at all. And that's what I mean by referring to the humaneness of, of the technology. Um, and Amanda spoke to this earlier. It's as simple as, is your language simple enough? Are you translating what's happening? If it's mobile first, are you making sure that your visually impaired clients are able to access the same information? Um, this is where I think focusing more on the humane aspect of what technology does for all humans, which is connect us to each other. Storytelling has come up. I think that's a, an area where WIC can also really, um, really thrive. The storytelling is what this emotional impact uh, that design can bring to technology is, is a really important key player, key factor. So I'd be curious to see how to think through the technology design process and the products, um, putting people not only center, but uh, making sure that you're including people at the very beginning of any discussion about what a technology is doing for them. Perfect, thank you. And Amanda, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on this thread as well, because I know you, I, I can tell you've got uh, <laughs> a lot to say on this thread. Please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean, so part of what is really exciting about really thinking about this as building trust is we have all kinds of fantastic community-based organizations who are out there, right? And we learned this in real time during the pandemic where we didn't have time to build long-term trust. So we had to find where are the people that are already trusted? Where are the community groups? Can we build toolkits so that Code for America isn't necessarily bringing people through the process, but we're already using community-based organizations to try and help them through. And I think as a long-term strategy for reaching people where they are, that is bringing the community along on an ongoing basis. So I was really excited to say that because we keep learning this lesson, which is there are some fantastic people and that's all about lived experience and what, um, and what we're hearing from Hildreth about bringing them in, not just at a moment of research, but ongoing over time too. Mm -hmm. That's great. And again, I, I imagine there's also some really wonderful technical solutions that can help with fostering that community engagement and trust as well. Um, we're almost out of time. I've got one question actually from Dr. Blumenthal that I'll ask to close it out. But um, I, I wanted to take that. This is a very rare opportunity for all of us to be here. Do any of you have any questions for each other that you want to ask before we uh, before we ask one final question from Susan? <laughs> Put you all a little bit on the spot there. If you think of it, if you think of it, let me know. We've got about two minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask one that we could answer oh. in two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to ask a closing question from Susan. Um, so she asks, "What can be done for the states that don't have the recess resources or tech proficiency? It's a patchwork system. There may be convenings going on, but what is needed for the implementation process? Should the USD play a greater role?" So I'll open that up if anybody else, anyone, wants to raise their hands and um, offer some remarks to this one. 
Susan always asks the tough questions. Rachel, yeah, go for it. Well, I think the USDA does play a role. And when funds are awarded for tech projects, US, USDA plays a very strong role in implementation. Um, and that was certainly evident in EBT. So um, it's true in our project for online ordering. I think there's um, some thinking about how to do this more with the funding that was mentioned, the 390 fund. And um, so I think that there is a process for USDA to support, but also we, we do need more flexibilities. We need... Um, we need updated um, child nutrition reauthorization. We need policy to allow us to explore these things. Um, and so I think it's a combined effort, but resources are good and um, support technical assistance is very important. Fabulous. And Amanda, go ahead. I still go back to a little bit of we are what we measure. And so to the extent mm -hmm. that we measure where the biggest gaps are, and if those are states that don't have enough funding or we can figure out different ways of tackling that problem, I think if we center it around that kind of conversation and build policy around it, um, then you can see the gaps and you can figure out whether it's tech talent you need or resources you need, but we haven't had that kind of discussion enough to be able to identify how do we close these gaps and how do we close them in the biggest places across the country. So everyone, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up there. Um, you know, again, throughout this whole day, I, I know I've learned so much throughout the past couple of hours about, you know, how can we increase awareness? How do we increase enrollment, retention, and address all these stigmas and other barriers and challenges? Um, I, I'll, I'll end with uh, just reflection on uh, Harry's remarks about kind of climbing Mount Everest together. And I think, uh, you know, I personally am so inspired that there are so many great efforts happening and that if we do band together and work with our grassroots communities and work with each other, we really can make a difference here. So um, with that, um, thank you so much to each and every one of you for participating in this panel. And I'm going to turn it over to our fearless leader, uh, Dr. Susan Blumenthal, to uh, offer some closing remarks. So thanks so much to everybody. And Susan, thank you so much for all of your leadership thank and you. incredible work. Well, thank, thank you so much um, to David Kong for being a fantastic moderator and to all of our terrific panelists for sharing their perspectives on, on the progress that's being made and also you know, the promise for integrating technology, but making sure that it is human-centered designed. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us today in this Wiring Wick virtual symposium and our collaborators at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, the Department of Nutrition, Dr. Willett, and for do uh, Dr. David Newman from the MIT Media Lab. We're very grateful that this was really a cross-disciplinary um, endeavor and a, a really a journey to uh, be inclusive and, and to really reimagine what could be uh, Wick's future you know, in uh, this decade and, and beyond. Uh, next slide. Thanks to all of the speakers. They were fantastic, uh, diverse perspectives. Um, and to all of uh, the, the attendees uh, on this virtual symposium, we are so grateful for the work that you're doing and for your support of WIC and for the ideas that you have about how we can strengthen it for the future. Next slide. You know, we, we've heard today that, um, you know, some of the challenges. And the pandemic really has uh, provided an opportunity to waive some of the, the barriers to participation in the program. But we still have, you know, 50, only 57% of people who are eligible for WIC are participating. And there is a very dramatic attrition rate with 98% of infants that are enrolled, but only 25% of four-year-olds. So what can be done to enhance that? And that's what this Wiring Wick Symposium was all about. That's what your work is all about. Creating a technologically enhanced WIC can provide more ways to reach participants and meet their diverse needs, helping to boost participation and retention in the program. Next slide. Our concluding message today is that modernizing WIC is an opportunity to improve the nutrition, health, and economic security of millions of people in the United States, providing a healthy start in life for children, reducing medical cost link with hunger and obesity, and as a result, strengthening America's future now and in the years ahead. Next slide. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you would like a copy of the Wiring Wick report, please uh, visit wiringwick.org. There's also a button at the bottom of, of the screen um, to get the PDF of it. And again, thank you all uh, for your work. Let's keep working together to strengthen WIC now and in the future. Have a great afternoon.